Hello, welcome to Leaders in Shape. Now, as you've just seen, my name is Connor Geerty, and I'm one of the vice presidents of the British Academy. You've seen a bit about that just now, too. Shape, I hear you thinking to yourself, what on earth is shape? Well, the idea is that we have this new acronomic emphasis on social sciences, humanities, arts, add politics, add environment or economics, and you get shape. It's not quite a rival to STEM, but it's trying to understand the place of these disciplines in our culture. And so we're talking to people we think shape the culture. They do something in the world of shape, but they shape our culture in doing so. And I am delighted to have for this first 30-minute interaction with questions afterwards by the audience. Regrettably, we can't see one of the effects of COVID, but we're looking for your questions later. I'm delighted to have Hermione Lee, Dame Hermione Lee, prodigious writer of biographies, prodigious. Virginia Woolf, Edith Wharton, Penelope Fitzgerald. Also, I think the reason we're so keen to have her and so delighted to get her, a thinker about what what the field of writing biography is about, not just the deliverer of tomes, but a reflector on what they're about in the abstract way. And I missed out that she's a dame. I think it's a dame of the British Empire. She's been a president of a college in Oxford. Also, a person who's at home in and part of what we call our contemporary culture. So in many ways, uh, an ideal guest. And she's just written a book. This is not a promo for the book, but there is a new book. And one of the incentives for doing this is you get to read the books. And <laughs> I was really knocked out by it. It's a biography of Tom Stoppard. And so we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that in a minute. But first of all, Hermione, welcome to this. Thank welcome. you. Thank you very much. And I wanted to ask you a sort of basic question, why biography? I mean, here you are, you're very good at school, you're sitting at home reading all the books, and you go to university and you study English. Why, why devote yourself? I suppose I could be a little mean to other people's lives. Mm. Well, I am very curious about other people's lives. So I suppose there are some base motives, um, as well as sort of high educational motives. But I, I think that in a way I was perhaps a refugee from critical theory in the 1980s. I very much wanted my academic life and my writing and my research um, and the books I wrote to use the same language throughout. I didn't want to be using a highly specialized, um, even arcane language. And I, I didn't really buy the idea of the death of the author and the freestanding text. Um, so I think that I, uh, I was also very influenced by wonderful books in what we loosely call the golden age of biography. Um, Richard Elman's Joyce, Leonie Dell's Henry James, um, Michael Holroyd's Lytton Strachey. Those books were very important to me when I was beginning to be a, a, a literary person. Um, so I think it was a combination of loving these big, exciting books about writers that I liked, um, and also wanting to, yeah, wanting to write life stories as a way of thinking about writing. I could never write a book that wasn't a literary biography. That's all I can do. But did you kind of, picking up one of the points there, there is that dislike is too strong critical theory. You didn't feel part of where things were. Was there a part of you that wanted to be read, as it were? And did you feel, am I putting words in your mouth, that you could have had a perfectly respectable academic career, which was removed from what people understood the world to be about? Was it too research? I I had a I had a little book. I used to present a book program in the 1980s called Book Four, uh, which was uh, in the days when Channel Four had a sort of educational remit. Um, and I had an amazing time over five or six years meeting a lot of writers who had books out at that time um, and who 
uh, who were willing to come and talk in the studio about the, about their books. And I think I felt very strongly that what I was doing then at York University as an academic, uh, talking to students about books, and what I was doing on this book program were part of the same thing. I didn't want them to be separate enterprises. I see, I see. So in some ways, you're trying to get out of the academy. You mentioned Channel 4 as well as stay within it. And, and perhaps that's a way we try to influence, but it doesn't matter to you whether they're literary or political figures. I mean, Stopper, we'll get on to him in a moment. He's a bit of both, isn't he? But you're mainly literary, aren't you? That's your thing. Why that? Why not Harold Wilson? Why not uh, take uh, Roy Foster, uh, Yeats, who is both political and and uh, literary? Why, why was literary? Well, Roy is a phenomenon uh, and he has this extraordinary ability to be a brilliant historian and also uh, to write absolutely wonderfully about poetry as in his new book about um, Seamus Heaney. Uh, I, I can't do that going across into a different world. I couldn't write a biography of an architect or a mountaineer or a gardener, although I might be interested in, in all those things. I want to find out what the sources are for people's writing. Um, and they have to be writers that I admire and like. Uh, it, I mean, I have to like the work in order to want to write about them. Um, so I couldn't uh, write about uh, uh, the life of a politician. I mean, I suppose I could if somebody offered me lots of money and I had all the documents. <laughs> but I, I wouldn't enjoy it. Um, it it wouldn't be uh, it wouldn't get to the heart of me. I need to have some literary involvement with the subject. Yeah, now on that I could see that because there's not a lot of gossip. You said you're interested in people. Not an awful lot of gossip in this fantastic book. Uh, there's a lot of good literary analysis. I think it's what makes it exceptional and reminds one of so many of the plays, including ones I hadn't, for example, heard of. Now Carlyle said. You take an open, loving heart. I got it from one of your thoughtful books on what it is to write biography. But, I mean, is he really <laughs> as lovely as he appears to be? People who haven't read it, Tom Stoppard can do no harm to anybody. The one thing, I mean, there's lots of examples. But there's some lady, he's, he's living above in some apartment somewhere, and he makes an incredible noise all, all, all evening writing or something. And she says, oh, it's just Tom or something. Not even the people whom he causes noise nuisance to your mind. You go through his personal life and they all seem to be lovely. He writes to everybody all the time, thanking them for this, that and the other. Do you think you carried open, loving heart a little bit too far on this one, Hermione? Well, I think you're giving a slightly uh, sentimentalized account of my book, actually. Uh, the, the little anecdote you inaccurately referred to just then was about Tom as a young, very young writer scribbling away, uh, typing away frantically all night. And his landlady sweetly yeah, attributes it to the rain falling, which is rather yeah, nice. Well. So she's the nice character in that anecdote. I did try, as some reviewers have noticed, to get across um, a character who, although generous and loyal and kind and much liked and much admired, is also, I think, uh, steely, uh, somewhat reserved, in spite of the fact he's also very gregarious, um, and can be uh, quite fierce and ruthless uh, in the interests of his own work. So, for instance, just to correct the balance a little bit, if I may, um, one of the stories I was told by one of his, um, one of the American directors, uh, Jack O'Brien, who's often directed his work, um, is of uh, Stoppard coming into an early rehearsal uh, of a four-hander. Um, and O'Brien saying to him afterwards, you know, what's what's it like? What do you think? And and Stoppard says, it's fine, except that the four wrong people are in the room. Now that's not that's not the remark of a of a, a sort of softy, and I don't think uh, the book presents him as such. On the other hand, it is true that in the theatrical profession, which is not without malice, um, sometimes entirely unlike the academic profession, of course. Of course. Um, uh, it, it's hard to find uh, people who will say bad things about him. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, I was thinking about it from my own point of view. I'm a lawyer. I didn't say it at the start, I'm a lawyer. And I hate meeting judges because they turn out to be nice, human beings coping with their world. 
and I might have written some savage attack on his judgment or some pompous left-wing critique of their whole establishment. Uh, do you find living people tricky, meeting them, thinking, golly, he's going to read it? Does that affect the way you write as compared with, say, people who've died? It's a very important question. And of course, writing the life of a living person is both a huge advantage and also a challenge. Um, it's a huge advantage in the, if they're being helpful to you as he was, uh, they can provide you with materials which you wouldn't otherwise see. Um, it's also a huge advantage in that you can talk to them uh, and you can also talk to people who, who know him. But as you've inferred uh, and implied, that talking to people who know him is obviously um, uh, a precarious thing to do because they are very aware that what they say about him uh, will be in the book and he will read it if he reads the book, which he did. Uh, he was entitled to read it uh, in order to correct me on matters of fact. And so we did have a yeah. session in which he went through um, and he didn't pull the plug on anything, but he did correct me on some matters of fact. And I was aware that all these people I was talking to, some of them major figures, many of them major figures in their own professional lives, had a, had an acute sense that they wanted to say what he would like to hear. And that I think you have to take on board and, and measure that. That's interesting because in a way you are taking that on board. And um, one of the paradoxes about biography, it seemed to me, thinking about this, reading the other ones as well, and your little books on it, is you both have to be objective and can't be objective. So you need to be not him or his idolizer or his obsessive critic, but you recognize one of your little, one of your shorter books that there's no such thing. You know, you, you may not be a critical theorist, but you certainly understand that there's no such thing as objectivity, that you bring yourself to it. How do you crack that? How can it be simultaneously both? I wonder if there's a resemblance to being a, a lawyer uh, in that you marshal the facts of the case and you speak to witnesses and all, all of that yeah. but there you cannot make your own personality and your own judgments entirely disappear people um write biography from the vantage point of their class their race their education their gender um uh their predilections what their education what they already know so you cannot remove yourself from the picture but what you have to try and do i think is weigh the evidence in the way that it resembles um le legal action i suppose um you have to not trust just one witness but make the testimony of witnesses corroborate um you have to come back to the subject if you are lucky enough to have a living subject with the same questions more than once to see yeah. if you will get the same answer and so on so these are all quite familiar methods i imagine to a legal mind they are they are they're very like cross-examination and looking for evidence to substantiate and then putting your background as far back as you can while being aware it's there but the thing is there are multiple cultures you know there are a whole lot of cultures that generate in our little community in our world uh generate different kind of biographies so we have sort of if he has one wayne rooney we have those various people called kardashian we have celebrities we have pop stars of whom i won't and you may not have heard do they have less value in your opinion reflecting our culture capturing parts of it than the kind of biography i read is political and that you write which is literary are, are we are we able to say, well, actually, what we do has more value, or is that pompous? Well, I don't think they have less value in terms of the readership. Uh, the readers will look for things that are valuable to them. Um, readers who are not in the least bit interested in British theatre or in the history of Czechoslovakia uh, historically um, uh, and so on are not going to be reading a life of uh, Tom Stoppard, I'm probably not going to be reading a life of Kardashian because it doesn't interest me. But for the people to who for whom that's interesting, then it does have value. I think the problem with value is the question of lasting importance and influence. I've taken a punt, as it were, on Tom Stoppard. I think that his work will last, and I'm not alone in thinking that. Um, there is a danger about writing someone who's alive or recent, because you have to gamble 
uh, on the possibility that the, the value is going to last. I mean, I think talking about cultural difference in a slightly different way, one of the things that fascinates me about him is that he's got this mixture of high culture and popular culture in his life. He loves rock music. Um, he's not in the least bit interested in opera. You know, I, he, there's a wonderful line at one point where he says, I bet Samuel Beckett never went on Call My Bluff. Uh, you know, <laughs> he's, he's, he's open to all kinds of yeah. cultural movements. And I, that's one of the things I liked about writing about him. Yeah, I loved his, I mean, we're, you know, people can read it, but letters to his mom, you know, and they're just wonderful, weekly practically. Where I can't believe I'm going to Buckingham Palace. So there's a sort of small boy atmosphere to him throughout. He is, you picked up the point about Czechoslovakia. He, I want to ask you about this, about shaping culture, because after all, this is so called leaders in shape. There's no doubt that he's a playwright who has somewhat molded our world in both his plays and then in his political activism, which many of us misunderstood as so called right wing, but which in retrospect, looks so powerful. We will have seen the plays that he did on TV. We will have known of his friendship with Havel. There is a person who indisputably is shaping our culture, good or ill. I think good, but definitely shaping. Now, is a biography just, uh, I think you say it, I think an index of its time, does it, however, do more than reflect? Do you think it can somehow influence culture as well as reflect what it finds. Do you have that ambition? Um, this is a complicated question. In a way, it's a question about him and it's a way, in a way, it's a question about the form. So can I sort of quickly answer it in two bits? Um, one is about his, his own politics uh, with a with a small p, if you like. Um, he he came to England, in fact, as a refugee, although he didn't use that word uh, at the age of eight. And he says he put on Englishness like a coat. And he was uh, conservative in he is conservative in his temperament and has been so. And he had the horror of totalitarian regimes, which came with having escaped from a life in. Um, Czechoslovakia as a writer under the communist uh, Stalinist regime. Um, and so he often set his own lucky chance and his own life against that, that of Václav Havel, for instance. Um, and he was a great supporter of Charter 77 and all through his working life from plays like Professional Foul, which you referred to, right through to Leopoldstadt, um, he has been uh, a supporter of um, Soviet refuseniks, of political prisoners, um, of Charter 77 and so on. So he's he has constantly been, as it were, arguing in his plays for uh, freedom of thought, independence of speech, true speech, against the kinds of oppressions and restrictions of a sort of totalitarianizing utopian uh, scheme of government. So you can see that in many, many plays, including Coast of Utopia and so on. So, in, so to get to the second part of your question, in writing about that, which I think is a deeply, deeply important part of his life and work, not, a, not least because he was for a while misconstrued as a kind of heartless stylist who didn't have those sorts of interests. In writing about that, I do think that this particular biography uh, and going out from that biography as a genre can have some kinds of social value, to use that dangerous word, even if it's not about, oh, Nelson Mandela or Gandhi yeah. or, or Sylvia Pankhurst. I mean, clearly those books will have a very important kind of social impact or, or uh, group biographies um, uh, of uh, such as um, in these times written by Jenny Uglo about the what was happening to ordinary people in this country under the Napoleonic Wars or the book that Carmen Khalil has just written about um, Happy Days about what happened to working class poor people when they were taken to Australia in the 19th century. So there, there is a burning desire to write about the lives of, of group, masses, ordinary people with an individual, an exceptional individual, when you're writing about that. I think surely the biography does bring with it all kinds of really crucial 
um, issues of politics and society. Yeah, what's interesting is, I think, what do people take away from big, long book? And uh, that's what's sustained and what the book produces, as it were, by way of a potential impact. For me, it was the glory of the subsidised theatre, the BBC. It was the chances the guy got, the backings he was given. And I had a feeling about it as an almost elegiac reminder of how it was. Then I thought, I'm just an old guy. I'm always thinking about the past being better than the present. And that there was some way in which this was a kind of a kind of a promise to fortify a time that was already past. Well, um, I think that that kind of nostalgia certainly comes in when one's writing this story. One of the things that's remarkable about his early writing life before he had leapt to fame with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern is um, how much opportunity there was for him to write television plays, really, really good television plays and radio plays. And the wealth of opportunity there was, for instance, on the radio with a producer like John Tideman. I mean, I'm not saying those days are gone, but there doesn't seem to be quite, a, quite that largesse of opportunity anymore. Um, and the life of the theatre, of course, he wrote for the West End Theatre as well as for the subsidised theatre, but certainly the history of the National Theatre chancing its arm in its very early days on a play um, about two minor characters from Hamlet by a completely yeah. unknown 29-year-old playwright. Wow, you know, that's a, that's a very exciting memory. And I think now with the, you know, the appalling current fate um, which is being gallantly battled against by numerous individuals of, of the theatres um, uh, and what seems to me an inadequate uh, political support for uh, musicians and actors and the world of the arts. Um, reading about these great plays in their productions and so on, I hope will be, if not nostalgic, then perhaps comforting in a way. For and, the and, and possibly energising. So, so I, I'm thinking about moral purpose. Would it be fair to say that an intention is to galvanize a strong feeling of support for that and not to just accept that it goes without saying there shouldn't be any? I'm thinking it's, it's, it's not at all like your book, but a biography I've read just this year, which has an absolutely riveting moral purpose, which is the one by Mary Trump on her uncle. And the moral purpose there is to try and explain and warn. Would you say, I mean, that's a dramatic example, but it's a fantastic book, I thought. But would you say you have a moral purpose or is that too big a claim in the writing of biography? I, I would feel very pretentious and ostentatious in saying such a thing. Um, but I think that uh, a life and not just a life of Tom Stoppard, but a life, say, of Virginia Woolf or a life of Penelope Fitzgerald. Um, to write such a life and to try and find out how the conditions of those lives got turned into art um, has, a, has a kind of um, a valuable uh, feeling about it to me, which is that it's about transformation. Uh, we're all leading our lives and we're all having experiences which um, are, you know, difficult or challenging or painful um, for, for many people, particularly this year. Um, uh, the, the people amongst us who have some gift and some talent and the energy and the determination and indeed the ruthlessness to transform those experiences into works of art that can be read by people who don't know them at all is something that moves me very much. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, by writing Tom Stoppard, it means we don't have the next question you must have got fed up with, which is why do you only write about women writers? And now you don't, you don't only write about women writers. Was there any well, kind of difference in writing about a man? I have, I, I should say that I have written a little bit about some uh, male writers before now. You but, have, uh, not, 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 a, not, a not a big, not a big biography yeah. like this. Um, it seems embarrassing to say that, uh, to say this, but it didn't actually occur to me. It wasn't one of the things that occurred to me when I was asked uh, 
to write this life, I didn't think, oh, now I'm going to write about a man at all. I thought, oh, now I'm going to write about the theatre. That's a very different thing for me than writing about uh, fiction writers. Um, and it doesn't. It didn't at any point strike me as an odd thing for me to do. Um, and I didn't approach it uh, in a different kind of way. That's not to say that when I have written about people like Edith Wharton or Virginia Woolf or Penelope Fitzgerald or Willa Cather or Elizabeth Bowen, I haven't been very taken up with what they have to say about the condition of women and the, the situation of women and what they have and how they have written their women characters. So that has that has been and is an enormously important and interesting thing for me. But I didn't set out to choose different colour pens, as it were, when I wrote this book. Fascinating. Now look, we're going to get to the the audience. There's been a bunch of questions coming in and I will faithfully relay them in a minute, but I can't resist two little questions at the end. One. An academic you really respect says, I want to do your biography. I know you're going to tell me nothing's happened. Lots has happened. It's a very full life. It, we need this inspiration. Will you please help? What would your answer be? Yes or no? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> I'm going to run a mile. I'm going to burn everything. I'm going to destroy the evidence. There's no story to be told. Um, yeah, I wouldn't mind being in a group biography with a lot of other writers that I admire at this moment in time, but I don't want, I would be horrified at the thought of a book about me. Right, I should leave that hanging in the air. You're on a desert island, and at the end of it, they say, What's your favorite biography? What's your favorite? Who's your favorite biographer? You're not allowed, like those occasional guests on Desert Island, like this, to choose any of your own books. What's your favourite biography? Who's your favourite biographer? Then we go to questions. I think I would take with me my dear friend Jenny Uglow's book, uh, The Lunar Men, uh, which is a wonderful, wonderful, adventurous, original example of how biography can explore many lives at once and a most brilliant way of writing about science at a point of uh, in, the, in the 18th century, a point of amazing discovery and invention. Um, and it's a great book about uh, English eccentricity um, and a particular place in England. So uh, it's a difficult one for me to choose, but because there, there are many others I would also like to choose, but, but um, that would do it for me. And your favourite biographer is also Jenny or somebody else entirely? I think um, it's hard to say a favourite biographer, um, but I must say I have been really uh, in influenced and and you know shaped in a way by Michael Horroy's work. Uh, I thought that at the time that book on Lytton Strachey was one of the most extraordinary things I've ever read. And I love the jokiness and the wit and the stylishness of what he does. Marvellous. Thank you. So I love the way you slipped in shape at the end of our discussion since we're desperately trying to make this part of a shape series. Great. The first question, these are questions that have come, a bunch of them have come. We'll try and get through them. Uh, this is somebody, I don't know who it is. We, we're, we're not allowed to reveal, I don't even know who it is. In your wonderful book about Penelope Fitzgerald, okay? Uh, here it comes. It seems to me as if you're not saying everything, that there are things that you did not say, maybe because you felt that it was gossip. And now this anonymous person says, have I read rightly between the lines? It's a very astute, uh, question, but actually it has to do with her and not to do with me. I put in what I knew, um, what I could learn about her. She, um, I knew her a little bit, though I didn't know I was going to be her biographer when I met her and interviewed her and um, met her socially. She was a very, she was a, a, she was a kind of genius, I think, and she was a very evasive and private and mischievous person. So she would lie to interviewers. Um, for instance, she wrote a wonderful book about um, Moscow before the revolution, the beginning of spring, I don't know if you know. Um, and it was completely immersed in the atmosphere of uh, Russia in that time. And people would say to her, oh, you must have spent a long time in Russia. Um, 
and sometimes she would say yes yes i lived there for months and sometimes she would say no i've never been there in my life uh, and the truth was that she'd been there for a month on a package tour <laughs> and she just it was just how she felt on the day yes yeah, so it's sort of true thank you very much that must have been a tricky slippery subject for you and you met her slightly didn't you briefly before ever you got stuck into the work isn't that right Yes, I, I interviewed her a few times, and um, she she gave a very she gave me a very nice review for my biography of Virginia Woolf, which I greatly cherished. Ah, right, quite early on. Here's a question. It's a more general one. It's it's uh, you wrote your first biographies in the eighties and nineties, and uh, has the way you write biography changed over the years? Are you consciously aware of change? Yes, I think. Um, I think I've become um, perhaps less stuffy <laughs> um, and less formal in the way I write. I think I've been able to relax more in the way that I write. I also have tried over the years to write a slightly different kind of book, depending on who I'm writing about. I do somewhat take my inspiration from my subject. So when I was Virginia Woolf, I was very, uh, under the spell of and and influenced by how critical she was of biography and how limited she thought biography was so i felt i couldn't write a sort of standard cradle to grave biography about her. i wanted to take a leaf out of her book when she talks about digging out deep pools behind her characters in mrs dalloway where they're going through their linear life but they're also go stepping back in time um and so i would have these chapters which were somewhat themed uh, as well as hanging on to the chronology and when i came to edith wharton for instance i she's such a material girl that I wanted to have these very richly furnished rooms so that you would go into the Italian room or the French room and so on. So I, I, I slightly changed my, my uh, not my style because I don't think you can, but the, the sort of form of yeah. what I've done. What, what I want to pick up is the start of that really interesting set of remarks. You've become more relaxed and I have a vision of how our culture has changed around us where when you start, you're uh, a woman in quite a male environment. As I far vaguely remember, it was Oxford. Is it Oxford mainly? And there's a feeling of reticence. And then I'm, I'm putting words in your mouth and you must resist. But then as you become more successful, more established, you line up and you think, actually, I don't have to any more worry. This is me. So would you say that's true or untrue? There's a kind of journey towards kind of genuine authenticity which is is linked to your authority and broadly your cultural power well i don't think i've got any cultural power actually but um i think i'm part of a literary world that's as far as i would take that but um i haven't always been in oxford that's one thing i spent a long long time in i spent time in liverpool and in york i was in york for 20 years and um so i wasn't always as it were under the <laughs> under the shadow of the Oxford tutorial, if that's what you're <laughs> implying. But I think certainly um, uh, I have felt when I, I mean, for instance, in the 80s, I wanted to write a book about Elizabeth Bowen. It wasn't a, a biography, although it had biographical material. It was very much a study of the work because I was in love with the work. I couldn't get a, I couldn't get a publisher for years to publish anything about Elizabeth Bowen because she was deemed to be an unimportant minor Anglo-Irish writer. All that has completely changed. So that change in reputation of certain writers, um, you know, has partly also been attributed to, to movements like Virago, uh, of which I was sort of, you know, on the edge. So the way in which women writers um, uh, that I've written about have become more read and more accepted, that's been a very important part of my life. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go on to the next question, which which starts with a lovely story. And is, there is a question, but here's the story. One of the best theater going experiences of my life was to find myself sitting beside Tom Stoppard at a revival of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead at the Old Vic a few years ago. The play was 50 years old and he was taking notes in the dark through the performance. I had a sense he continues to tinker with his work. And now the excuse for telling us that lovely story, which you didn't need by the way, anonymous speaker, that's a lovely story. Did you, during your research, find out whether he has, in fact, continued to work on change most of his performed plays? Is he constantly at it? Yeah. Um, 
that's a that's a great story and in fact uh, it matches my experience exactly which is that i was very kindly allowed by david laveau the director of that uh, 50 year, 50th anniversary revival of rosencrantz to sit in on quite a lot of rehearsals um so there was this extraordinary uh, scene of a cast which largely consisted of people who had not been nearly born um, by w when that play was first put on, including Daniel Radcliffe. Um, and they were asking him lots of questions about the play and to which he was responding very carefully and thoughtfully. And he was also still 50 years on, ch slightly changing and slightly tweaking this classic text. Um, for instance, he gave a couple more lines to, from Hamlet to Gertrude in that production. I mean, this didn't get into the published 50th anniversary um, text, uh, but it did get into the production. And so here is a playwright who often says that he doesn't think of theatre as a kind of set in stone, as a kind of fixed art form, but as something that is fluid and open-ended and can change, uh, still um, still tweaking and working on a, a, a classic play. And it's a rather moving thing. And to me, very moving also, because I feel there's a something of an analogy with biography in that I like to think of biography as containing unfinished business open-ended questions, things that haven't been found out. I, I hate the word authorised and I hate the word definitive because there is no such thing as a definitive life. When you're writing them, there's another question, but just quickly, how, how demanding are you of the notional reader? You know, it's late at night, they're on page 458 of Stoppard or whoever it is. What do you, how much care and attention do you do you think legitimately demand of the reader? I have a I have a imaginary reader who is a sort of multi-headed, <laughs> sort of plural being, in that I know with a book like this, uh, I know there will be readers who are completely gripped by what there is about the plays who who have come to it because they love the plays or love particular plays and they will go often straight for that chapter i know that i've had people writing to me saying i got it and i immediately read the chapter on the invention of love and now i'm going to read the rest of the book so that's a certain kind of reader there are you said at the beginning there wasn't any gossip in this book i rather sort of bristled at that because i thought well, there was not much right. i meant not much not much. No. Well, uh, you, can, you, you will know about his life by the time you finish reading this book. And there will be readers for whom that's actually um, the political, the social, personal part is the bit they really love. And then again, there are readers who are deeply interested in the story of someone who turned himself into an Englishman. So for a, for a life, a very rich and various life like this, there are going to be different kinds of readers. And one of the reasons the book is a long book is that I, I had a huge amount of material, which no one else would have. Um, it's a very big and, and prolific um, and complex life. And also I felt I owed it to this multi-headed reader to do all the different sides of this life. You may have answered our last question. I'm not sure, but you're identifying certain aspects of Stoppard, which made him an appealing subject. The last question is, uh, abrupt but well-intentioned, why did you pick a, pick a playwright to write about? And why Stoppard, as opposed to, say, Carol Churchill? So did you have a sort of beauty parade of potential subjects? I hope that I hope someone does write a really good life of Char Carol Churchill. That would be a really fabulous uh, book to read. Um, maybe someone's working on it now. Um, I was asked to do this, uh, and um, I said yes. Uh, and after I said yes, I thought, gosh. <laughs> Six years later, I thought, yeah, well, that was quite a challenge. Um, but uh, I hadn't thought of doing it. It came to me as a, a as a surprise, and I'm very glad that I said yes. It's it's been a most extraordinary adventure writing this book. Well, it's been I think adventure would be far too dramatic and lovely, but it's been most enjoyable interacting <laughs> with you, Hermione. Thank you so much for, for making yourself available and answering so clearly. And also you have a disconcerting for an interviewer knack of stopping. Our working assumption with interviewees is that they never stop, but you do stop. 
And of course, that can catch out interviewers. So that was wonderful. And thank you for the discipline. Now, thank we're you. going to thank sign you. off. No, thank you very much. We're going to sign off. Before we do, let me plug the next one of these, because the idea is to build a, a corpus of work about shape and leaders in shape. And that's going to be the theme. And we've got uh, this guy, Imran Razu, who's an economist. And we have a lot to talk about when it comes to economists shaping our culture. So keep an eye on the website, on Twitter feeds if you do Twitter, Facebook ubiquitously. It'll be in January. It's Imran Razul, and it'll be the same sort of structure. And uh, for now, thank you very much, you anonymous persons out there, for having taken the time to join this, or if you're watching the podcast, for joining the podcast. And have a very good evening if it's evening or day if it's day. Thank you very much. Thank you.